Hello, everybody. Um, I'm here live with Dr. Sanjay Shukla. Uh, he's the president and CEO of ATA Pharma. And um, I'm Andrina Johnson. I am the director and producer of an upcoming sarcoidosis awareness documentary entitled Project Purple Mission Sarcoidosis Awareness. And uh, Dr. Sanjay and I talked earlier this year in April, where uh, he introduced us to A Tire Pharma's A Tire 1923, the therapy that you all are developing for sarcoidosis, in particular pulmonary sarcoidosis, which is a type of sarcoidosis that affects the lungs. Uh, so, could you tell us a little bit more about uh, pulmonary sarcoidosis? And what are some of the symptoms that patients experience and uh, what happens if it goes untreated? Sure, sure. Thanks for having me uh, uh, back, Andrina. And, and I'm happy to talk a little bit more about what we're working on um, and some of the results of, of the data that we've, we've just put out. Uh, polysarcoidosis, you are correct, is the area we're focused on. Uh, here at ATIRE uh, in San Diego. Uh, this is the most common form uh, of, of sarcoidosis. Uh, uh, it can affect a number of organ systems, but many patients, I think upwards to 90% of the patients uh, will have symptoms uh, that afflict uh, their lungs. And these are largely due to the fact that uh, these clumps of immune cells develop in your lungs, and it can lead to a really bad shortness of breath, cough, fatigue, uh, and even chest pain. Uh, so it's, it's a, uh, a big problem for many folks uh, living with sarcoidosis. And as you point out, uh, if left untreated, it can get really serious. Uh, unfortunately, the treatments that most folks use are steroids. And I know last time we talked quite a bit about how bad steroids are, but uh, steroids do allow patients to uh, deal with these symptoms, uh, but they also come with uh, some some toxicity, uh, some sometimes significant toxicity. So it's a bad trade-off, and it's part of the reasons why uh, we here at ATIRE have been trying to work on a better therapy um, and a better alternative uh, to steroids uh, to help treat patients with pulmonary sarcoidosis. Awesome. So can you remind us again what type of treatment this is and how it compares to other treatments for sarcoidosis patients like that patient? Sure, sure. Device? So <clears throat> the goal with a lot of these therapies is to control uh, the, the, the inflammation that you might have in your lungs. And that inflammation, when it kind of goes haywire, that's really where you can develop a lot of you know bad symptoms. Um, Typically, the types of drugs that are used to deal with these, these symptoms and the inflammation are anti-inflammatories, steroids being the most common. But there's other kinds of anti-inflammatory treatments that are um, uh, called immunosuppressants, which really try to address your immune system kind of going wild here in your lungs. Uh, our therapy is a uh, anti-inflammatory that uh, we think uh, modulates and controls some of that inflammation. Uh, so you brought up the, the name of this therapy. Right now it's, it's in testing, so it has a, a kind of a boring name called ATYR 1923. Uh, but 1923's job is to really control your immune system, try to prevent all of that runaway inflammation, and hopefully help you uh, with your day-to-day uh, -day symptoms while at the same time, perhaps uh, being a, a much more safer alternative uh, to steroids. Yeah, is uh, <clears throat> prednisone is no fun to take. <laughs> uh, yeah, and, uh, and pretty much everybody who's been diagnosed with sarcoidosis can vouch for that, but you know, so it would be great to have an alternative. So last month, you announced the results of the phase two study of the, you say it, ATYR 1923 and uh, patients with pulmonary sarcoidosis. And uh, that is really what we want to talk about here. So can you tell us a little about this study and uh, what you are looking to evaluate? Sure, sure. So <clears throat> as I mentioned, we have been working on this therapy for uh, some time and we learned it was an anti-inflammatory. 
uh, we thought it could be really useful in helping sarcoidosis patients, uh, in particular with their lung symptoms. So we focused on pulmonary sarcoidosis, uh, which is the major form of sarcoidosis. So a couple of years ago, we started a, a trial uh, testing 1923 uh, in about 36 pulmonary sarcoidosis patients. Part of this trial was to evaluate uh, a number of doses of our therapy over six months. So this is a therapy that is administered. Uh, it's, uh, patients get it by uh, an IV. Uh, it's a one hour IV infusion. And the goal here is to just you know, take it that once a month and just hopefully see if the, we can get people uh, off steroids or even on their way to getting off steroids. So a key component we talked about last time was in our therapy was to evaluate the drug effects. Uh, this was the first time we were testing it in patients. The primary objective when you have this kind of trial, which is a phase two clinical trial, is really to make sure, number one, the drug is safe. So we have to make sure the drug is safe before we move things forward. But what we at ATIR were trying to also show is perhaps our therapy could be a better alternative to steroids. And could we also start to see some drug effects in our trial? So we tested in 36 patients. Um, uh, about eight patients got a one milligram dose of our drug. Uh, eight, about eight patients got three milligrams and another eight or nine got uh, uh, five milligrams. And then you also had a control population, patients uh, who received a placebo. Uh, why do you need that? Well, that's to sort of keep things honest, that are, are you really seeing effects related to drug or um, is this just a um, by chance, if you will? So there's a lot of uh, complicated statistics that go into this, but you set up this sort of trial, which is a placebo controlled trial. So patients go into the trial knowing that in, a, in the instance of our trial, you might have a one in three chance of getting placebo, but you're still a really, really important uh, person entering the trial because mm -hmm. this is the only way we can learn whether or not uh, the drug is really doing anything uh, beyond safety. Uh, so our trial looked at uh, 36 biopsy com confirmed sarcoidosis patients. We enrolled folks who are receiving prednisone every day, anywhere from 10 to 25 milligrams uh, of prednisone a day. And sometimes patients had been on that therapy for say 10 mm -hmm. years. Um, and our goal was to basically taper folks off steroids uh, down to five milligrams um, and then basically administer our therapy and see how how you did, how you did with regards to your symptoms, mm. how you did with regards to your um, lung function testing, uh, whether or not you could actually do well on, on a lower dose of steroids. Uh, so there was a, a number of these uh, exploratory measures that we looked mm. at. And then, as I said, the trial was six months in duration uh, and it was in, conducted in uh, uh, over, over a dozen centers here in the U.S. Uh, last month, we released results from our trial. Uh, what the trial showed, number one, is our experimental therapy mm -hmm. uh, was, in fact, very safe and well tolerated. When you're dealing with a drug that interfaces with your immune system, you want to make sure you don't cause new problems, things like uh, infections, or you're going to start to develop any kind of um, uh, antibodies to the therapy. Uh, we basically want to make sure um, the drug itself is not doing anything worse uh, to, to, your, uh, to your health. And we were happy to report last month that the drug in these 37 patients, we actually ended up enrolling 37, that the drug was safe and well tolerated. Uh, we didn't see really uh, any uh, concerning mm -hmm. adverse events. Uh, you know, the types of things we saw were, you know, what you would might expect where people report, hey, I'm, I'm um, I, I have cough, I have some, some, um, uh, some shortness of breath. And most of that was actually seen in the placebo population, which is also what you would expect. And then most importantly, you want to make sure that you don't, have, you don't have any kind of real serious effects. Mm -hmm. These are called serious adverse events. Uh, and certainly, you know, you don't want to have, you know, any deaths. Uh, so all of those things were accomplished in this trial from a safety perspective. Um, Let's not talk about some of the other. So I have a question. I have a question. So um, I found it interesting. So your patients in the clinical trial, they were on prednisone, a low dose? 
during the beginning of the trial? And did they taper to no prednisone by the end of the trial? Or were they still taking the prednisone? No, the trial was basically uh, a patient, uh, you know, to be eligible for the trial had to be taking at least 10 milligrams. So we had folks come in at mm -hmm. 10, 15, 20 milligrams of prednisone a day, you know, all the way up to 25. And to enter into the trial during the first eight weeks of the trial, uh, I asked all patients to taper down to at least five. Uh, so that was that was a big mm -hmm. accomplishment because we all know that you know if you're if you're doing well at 15 milligrams, for example, uh, you're going to be made unwell over the first say eight weeks of the trial. So I, I think you know there, there's huge appreciation mm -hmm. for people that went through this trial. Um, while you enter the trial, you get our therapy once a month. So in the course of those six months. Or the placebo. Or the placebo. Yeah. Or the placebo. Right. So this, <laughs> this is, and we don't we don't know what folks are on. The patients don't know what they're on. The docs don't know what they're on. But this is the only way where we can mm -hmm. sort of keep keep all of ourselves honest and say, let's look at the effects here. So, uh, you know, number one, from a safety perspective, um, the our drug did not make things worse. Uh, and and if anything, it looks like the types of symptoms, as you can imagine. If you're bringing people down and they were already managed well, they're going to report more symptoms. Mm -hmm. And we did see that in, in mm -hmm. the placebo, more so in the, in, in the placebo population. So that made sense to us that, number one, the drug is safe. It's not, it's not making anything, anything worse. Mm -hmm. Okay. So by the end of the study, um, what, were all of the patients still on prednisone um, with this medication? So or so what did we see we saw that uh patients who received placebo as we expected uh started to perform well uh, unwell mm -hmm. started to become unwell and over the course of say week 8 mm -hmm. week 12 16 24 you saw more and more of these folks develop symptoms and need to actually go back up on their steroid dose because that's what docs do mm -hmm. the doctors yeah. looked at them and when they came in once a month and said how are you doing with your special in particular, focusing on cough and shortness of breath. Um, and folks, as you might ex imagine, uh, had trouble. They had trouble. Uh, so we saw in the placebo population. Mainly in the placebo We saw in the placebo population, population uh, that, that um, uh, patients had to go kind of back up on their steroids. Uh, we saw in our one milligram, in our one milligram population that got our drug, the, the lowest dose, we also saw people kind of unstable. They had to actually get put up, put back up a little bit on their prednisone as well. So I didn't really see a difference between one milligram and placebo. Where we saw dramatic effects was with three and five. And that's where we saw in the three milligram group, most patients were able to maintain that five milligram uh, dose. And, and that's a huge win. You know, we were able to show that, okay, the drug is starting so, to do something yes yes that may be the recommended dose amount then in the future possibly. possibly possibly but i think what's really remarkable what some of the experts pointed out is once we got into our five milligram dose we tested this in nine patients mm -hmm. and three of those patients so three of those patients were able to get completely off steroids and that was i think rather remarkable yeah, this is, that's what I wanted to hear. That's what we want. So, so this is also this is another way yeah. for us to basically demonstrate that there's real things happening with the drug. That as we give a little bit more, we're seeing better and better effects. The other big thing that I think overall is is the best take home here is uh, when you get into our five milligram dose, uh, on average, patients were able to drop uh, their their prednisone dose by fifty eight percent. So that that's a you know if you're taking fifty uh, if you're taking so ten or fifteen milligrams you, you don't need you can throw away five seven ten milligrams of prednisone uh, and and we all know that if you're taking that every day it adds up with a lot of sort of you know toxicity mm -hmm. so um, I was really happy to see that you know mm -hmm. one of the key components of the trial where we were able to you know spare people from steroids that's called steroid sparing. Uh, and then, then the other thing is we did see a few folks, uh, really, you know, a third of the population in the high, highest dose group 
three out of nine were able to get off steroids completely. Uh, so that was a, that was rather unexpected. Uh, so from a steroid per perspective, uh, we, we, we accomplished, you know, what we, we were hoping to see there. Okay. So the study did conclude that the um, ATYR 1923 could reduce the amount of steroids that patients needed. Um, that is one of... That right. is one of the top line conclusions. Our highest dose was able to uh, really impact uh, and, and reduce steroids by more than 50 percent, 58 percent. And we were able to even get people off steroids, three out of nine patients. So that, that was that was one of the ma major, That's major good. findings yeah. from the study. And, and remember, this is a small study. We have to start small. But I also think that uh, mm. those are some of the patients that uh, you know, as I said, had been on prednisone sometimes for, you know, seven, nine years. So for them in a short amount of time, uh, the mm. experts uh, basically thought the drug is working really, really, really fast. Um, there were a number of other things we looked at with regard to symptoms, lung function, and also your uh, inflammatory cells as well. Uh, so we can also talk about that uh, because I think those are also really, really encouraging findings. Yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah. Go yeah. Ahead. So steroid steroid, reduc that. steroid reduction is, I think, <laughs> really, really important for everybody. But also, for me, uh, I'm not a pulmonologist, but but I, but I am a a, a doctor, and, and I sort of just think to myself, w are people feeling better? You know, I mean, you want to take a drug, you also want to feel better. And we already yeah. talked about the biggest issues here are, um, you know, cough, shortness of breath, fatigue, things of that nature. And uh, was really thrilled to see that our drug, in all of the symptom areas we looked at, had real substantial benefit. We were able to substantially help patients with their cough, with their shortness of breath, uh, with their fatigue. Uh, the, the, these are all the important things that sarcoidosis patients mm -hmm. live with. And when we get, when we yeah, look at all of the one. symptoms, uh, again, our highest dose did the best. Three did pretty good. Five did even better. So I think that's really important because um, a drug not only has to do some mm -hmm. things with regard to steroid reduction, but I was also really wanting to make sure that, well, the drug also has to make people feel better. So really happy to report that uh, we also demonstrated a significant symptom improvement that over six months, patients reported a, a lot less cough a lot less fatigue and levels that doctors would look at experts would look at and say that level of improvement in your cough or shortness of breath is significant uh, so that was the other thing that the experts mm -hmm. uh, basically highlighted that uh, the drug is working fast to also improve symptoms so um how did patients feel when they were receiving the ATY um, R nineteen twenty three? Did they um, feel better than the patients who received the placebo? Absolutely, yes. Yeah. So we also had questionnaires. Uh, there's there's a questionnaire called the King Sarcoidosis Questionnaire, and that asks you, you know, how are you feeling with regards to your your mood, your insomnia, your general health, um, and also very happy to report that we saw very consistent findings there too, that compared to placebo, those patients that received our therapy uh, reported, again, substantial benefit uh, in all of those areas I talked about. So not only those core symptoms when we think about with the lungs, but folks started feeling better, their general health. Um, you know, the, the study wasn't really long enough to look at things like uh, like weight, you know, because that, that could be a big problem when you're taking a lot of, uh, of prednisone. But um, I do think that um, mm -hmm. uh, in all of those other measures, you know, you talk about fatigue, you talk about mood, you talk about insomnia. These are areas also where uh, the dr drug showed some really nice, nice findings. Um, and it was all consistent with what we saw with that other symptom improvement. Great. So um, did you see anything else improve in patients who received uh, this medication that might just, it was working, um, like lowering the markers of inflammation? 
Yes, yes. So that's also a very, very positive finding. We all know that uh, when you have sarcoidosis, you're going to have a lot of your immune cells really ramped up. Uh, so we have the ability to draw and take blood samples from uh, patients and look at it over the course of six months. Uh, what did we see again with our higher doses, three and five milligrams, and in particular five milligrams, it did a really, really nice job of a controlling inflammation, bringing down, calming down a lot of those immune cells that are, uh, you know, really, really ramped up in this condition. When we looked at the placebo population, as you might expect, they're getting less prednisone. They started to basically get more and more inflamed. Uh, when we saw one milligram, mm -hmm. maybe a little bit better. When we saw three and five, those patients at five milligrams had a really, really nice tight control of their inflammation. So now we know the drug is not only reducing your steroids, it was making you feel better in a number of symptoms, but I can also look at blood samples and also see effects there as well. So um, that, that was also, I think, a very, very important finding, especially for our research team that looks at these sort of um, mechanisms, if you will, of, of inflammation. Mm -hmm. Well, this sounds really encouraging. Um, what's the next step for ATYR 1923? Sure. I mean, the next... Do you have another study? With the next step here is really to plan a, a what I would say is a larger phase three trial, a worldwide trial. We've we, uh, attracted a lot of interest with our data uh, in, in uh, all parts of the world. Uh, so our goal here is really now to try to get this drug approved. Uh, we want to, we have to run a bigger study. Uh, we have mm -hmm. to run a, what's called a phase three trial. Uh, but now with the type of evidence that we've produced, uh, we think we really have a drug uh, that uh, we want to move fast. We want to try to get the drug uh, into a phase three trial because those are the types of trials you need to ver verify your findings in a small trial. Uh, hard to get a drug approved with just 30, 35, 37 patients. We're looking to enroll a trial now, which uh, likely will be, you know, a couple hundred patients. Uh, and this will be conducted mostly in the U.S., Europe, and Japan. Uh, why do we need to do that? Well, everything we see has to now, in a larger mm -hmm. trial, uh, be statistically significant for groups like the FDA. Uh, what we're determining now is, you know, w which of these sort of improvements are uh, the most important thing to someone like the FDA. Uh, we also saw really, really nice effects in improving lung function, uh, something called force vital capacity, which is really about how much air you can move in and out of your lungs. Um, as you can imagine, that's also a problem when you have sarcoidosis. We looked at that in our trial and also saw that our five milligram population did you know, really, really well compared to placebo uh, with uh, per percentage improvements that um, would be uh, mm -hmm. uh, clinically really important. So right now we're in the planning stage to quickly start another trial. Uh, we want to test uh, and then make sure that everything we saw in this trial, uh, we see it in a larger trial, and then hopefully try to get the drug approved here in a couple of years. Okay. So there has to be a third trial. Yes, there is. Unfortunately, I know I, I know this this can be frustrating here, but um, there is a process in running clinical trials. Um, you know, we started uh, five that years ago. Yeah. yeah, exactly, exactly. What I what I like okay. to tell folks, and I even so um, when we asked, like I'm sure all of us are wondering, how long does it take for this drug to become? Couldn't hear that. So, um, well, first before that third trial done. So, about getting the drug on the market. I see the question from Wendy, and it 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 involves a. I'm, I can hear you. Yeah, there's a little delay. Um, okay. It really it really involves a process where you have to test the drug very carefully um, to make sure. You know, as I said, first it's safe but then everything that you see, you've got to prove it 
uh, in, a, in a larger population of patients. So our next trial, uh, we're looking to get started next year. And because we're trying to enroll, say, around 200 patients, it will take some time to, to, to get 200 patients enrolled. Uh, and this will also be a study that will likely be longer than six months because we want to make sure these effects, we see them longer th than that. Uh, so our goal here is really to try to, um, you know, I think I told you this last time, try to get this drug approved in that, say, uh, you know, 2024, 2025 timeframe. I know that feels like a long time, but we started this process with this therapy, uh, you know, back in, um, say, 2016. Uh, so it takes about 10 years to get a drug mm -hmm. from what you might see in like a Petri dish to then eventually getting uh, available to patients. Uh, we have we have really carefully built this program that um, this therapy uh, really starts to we, we understand how it works with controlling immune cells. Um, and we, we, we think we're really at that last stage now. If we can just get past this one last hurdle here, um, I'm hopeful here that we can have a therapy, um, you know, in the, in, the, in the rather near future here for patients. Okay. So would this uh, likely just be available for patients with pulmonary sarcoidosis or will it uh, be available for people like me who have um, like neurosarcoidosis or disinvolvement in other organs? So that's um, that's a little bit of a, a tricky question to answer because when you test a therapy or a drug, you sometimes want to test it in a kind of a narrow group of patients. But once a drug gets approved, there are ways to start to test it in larger populations. Um, in my mind, there's no reason why a drug that helps uh, in pulmonary sarcoidosis might not be useful in other forms, cardiac or neuro, but we won't, we won't have specifically tested it there. This is where I'll work with the experts and determine, uh, you know, how do we proceed around uh, looking at the therapy in those kinds of populations? Um, you know, this is, some of this is a um, um, a decision on how to best get a drug approved, um, but there there can be then what's called phase four studies, which actually can happen much more rapidly. That you could start to test it in specific populations. This is why I always say that in sarcoidosis, and I said this last time you know, there's going to be a toolkit of medications that you need. Um, any biotech or pharma company that uh, tries to tell you, you know, this is the end all and be all. And I got, I got, you know, this is going to help everybody. Uh, I'm a doctor. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I, you know, this has got to be one of these things where I'm like, let's just start with something in the toolkit. Uh, if it can help pulmonary sarcoidosis mm -hmm. patients, it may have some, some ability to help those other areas. I wouldn't have specifically tested it that way. Um, but, it, but the goal here is let's get a drug approved uh, and then let's start to actually look very closely in those other forms of uh, sarcoidosis. My, my hope is the drug could be useful for all sarcoidosis patients, uh, but, but um, That'd be great. I have to follow the evidence that we have right now. And I can tell you it is helping pulmonary sarcoidosis patients. <clears throat> so Doug has a question. Um, was there or were there any side effects from the new drug? You know, um, Doug, great question. And I think that's the most important th thing right now in this trial. Um, we did not see any new kind of side effects. Uh, what I mean by that is the side effects that we saw uh, were pretty much related to what you might expect to have if, if you have sarcoidosis, pulmonary sarcoidosis, cough, shortness of breath, things like that. Then you have to ask yourself, was it any worse if you were on the drug versus placebo, no, it was not. It was actually less than that. So remember when you run a blinded trial, blinded means no one knows really what, whether you get placebo or not, you just report everything and you collect it. Uh, but what we did see is um, very, very mild adverse events, the type of adverse events you might expect to see if you have the disease to begin with. And we did actually see more of that in the placebo population versus the treated uh, which is also, you know, kind of what, what you want. You want to see uh, that the drug is not making anything worse. Uh, the things that we'll make sure to pay attention to in the next trial are the same things we looked in this trial. 
if we're talking about a drug that works with your immune system, we got to make sure that it doesn't actually make, for example, you more susceptible to infection because there are immunosuppressants that do that, which can help you with mm -hmm. your sarcoidosis, but it might open you up from, to mm -hmm. getting infections. We don't want that either. You don't want to trade one thing for the other. So that's something that um, you know, I, will, I will consistently yeah. look at, um, you know, not only in this trial, but in future trials. Cindy, uh, um, okay, yeah. <laughs> How long uh, did it take to show improvement? So we started to see, like, once they started, we, we started them. to see these effects rather quickly, uh, within uh, one to two months. So the drug was administered. You know, about eight weeks later, we started to see um, patients start to improve. Um, so at least in this trial, uh, it, the drug appears to work rather quickly. Um, I think, uh, why do I say that? It wasn't just the ability to just taper steroids quickly, but as I said, symptoms improved, your force vital capacity started to improve, uh, and then also some of those, um, uh, those biomarkers, those things you check in the blood, the inflammatory cells, we also started to see those trend down. So um, I, I, think, I think the effects were, um, you know, not overnight, but uh, I definitely think patients started feeling better uh, within eight to 12 weeks from starting the therapy. Awesome news. So how can patients stay up to date on what's happening with uh, ATYR 1923? Well, the easiest way is to, is to sort of uh, visit our company website or, or getting news from our company. We are a public company, so we put really everything out there. Uh, we, we have to do that for the public. Uh, so ATYR, um, ATYRPharma.com is how you'd find us, A-T-Y-R-P-H-A-R-M-A.com. Uh, but then we also partner very closely with the Foundation for Sarcoidosis Research in Chicago. Uh, so we also work very closely with the foundation uh, with regards to any news or any new information uh, or even information about the next trial. So that is the best way to stay on top of um, news from, you know, about this trial, what the next trial might look like. Uh, we also partner with a company in Japan, Kyorin Pharmaceuticals, uh, and they are handling all of the sort of Japanese side of the, of the next trial. Uh, so uh, we're, we're really lucky to have a strong partner there because there's many patients living in Japan uh, that are also uh, in desperate need for a, uh, a safer and better therapy. Okay. Well, that is awesome. I will. I do notice that FSR shares a lot of your stuff and um, many of us subscribe to their newsletter. So uh, it's always nice seeing them um, sharing your information. And you guys, thank you for joining us. I'm going to let the doctor go, but I really appreciate your time and for uh, answering our questions. Thank you. Thank you for the great questions. Uh, we're going to we're going to continue working hard here. Uh, really appreciate the interest. And I really want to give a special thanks to really the 37 patients that participated in this trial, uh, whether they got drug, whether they got placebo, they contributed a significant amount of medical knowledge uh, that now I'm working with the experts to really uh, dig through. Uh, we are one step closer uh, to a therapy here. Uh, there hasn't been a therapy, you know, dedicated for sarcoidosis in decades. Um, and it's certainly one of our passions, one of my passions here at ATIRE, uh, to hopefully get um, a therapy that can help patients here. So uh, th thanks. Thanks for um, doing this um, and inviting me, Andrina. My pleasure.